Well, welcome everyone to Grad School Cheese May. Um, this is our first um, ever grad, grad School Cheese May and our first attempt at Zoom webinar. So if we have any technical difficulties, we thank you for your patience. Um, this event is being sponsored by the Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month, Latinx Graduate Student Association, and the Clemson University Graduate School. My name is Kathleen Costello, and I'm the Director for Graduate Admissions and Recruitment here at Clemson University. Um, and we want to let you know that whether you know, you, you definitely know you want to go to grad school or you don't even know what grad school is, um, our hope is that you will walk away from this session with a better understanding about graduate school, the application process, and what life is like as a graduate student. Um, so we're going to have some question and answer time at the end. So if you have any questions that come to your mind throughout our session, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat and Larissa will be monitoring those. Um, you can you can post your question to all attendees, or you can just post it directly to Larissa, um, and she'll make sure that she asks us those questions when we have our question and answer time. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Here we go. Okay, so panelists, um, and we can we can go in the order that are we're showing on the screen. So we'll start with Dr. Garcia. Um, if you will share with us your name, uh, your pronouns, if you like, and your program, and then a little bit your where you're from um, and your heritage as well. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Carlos Garcia. I was born in Argentina. And after getting my PhD or my bachelor's in biochemistry and my PhD in chemistry, I moved to the U.S. as a postdoc. And then I took first position in San Antonio. And now I moved to Clemson about five years ago. And I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry. And I'm super happy to be a tiger. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Dr. Garcia. Uh, hi, my name is Julia Pacheco Cole. Uh, she, her, hers. I am currently a second year in the Student Affairs and Counseling Education program. Um, I am from Newbury, South Carolina. I was born in Merle Beach. I um, went to undergrad at Cornell University and then came back down south for my master's. So I took a two year gap um, between those and I am half Mexican, half white. Hey y'all, my name is Alex Jensen. I'm a PhD student in wildlife and fisheries biology, third year. Um, I did my master's in undergrad and I grew up out in California. And uh, my mom's side is my Mexican side and my dad's side is European side and pronouns are he, his. Hi everyone, my name is David Herrero. I was born in Honduras and I moved to the US for college. I did undergrad at Clemson University, um, graduated 2013, uh, worked for a year and a half or so in Charleston and did grad school back at Clemson. Um, and I'm currently working in Charleston for an architecture firm here. Um, so yeah, proud to be a Clemson Tiger too. Okay, thank you, panelists. Thank you for participating in our session tonight. Looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we have a series of questions to ask. And for the panelists, you feel free to answer and respond to any of the questions, but don't feel that you have to respond to every question. Um, you know, just as you, as you, whatever questions interest you the most, uh, feel free to jump in. So we're going to talk a little bit about the application process um, and like the pre-admissions aspect and then we'll talk about student life um, and after once you once you get accepted and enrolled into a graduate program. So um, this actually would be a good question for all of our panelists to answer um, and if it's possible to, to, to keep it brief. Um, Carlos is already, oh, Dr. Garcia has already warned us <laughs> that we might need to mute him. Uh, so why did you decide to pursue a graduate degree? I'll, I'll get started just because I'm the first one in that slide. Um, in my particular case, I was uh, intrigued by science and I really wanted to avoid doing the same thing every day. 
um, I was driven to physical chemistry from the beginning. Uh, and I always, since I can remember, um, I always wanted to do experiments. And after many, many, many years, I can probably say that I can no longer do experiments. I spend my days behind a desk. I can go next. Um, so for me, I was really interested in a job in student affairs. Uh, it's something I fell in love with kind of at the tail end of my undergrad career. So my um, undergraduate degree is in art which is totally different. Um, and I took my first gap year. I wasn't really sure if I wanted to pursue a master's. And then I tried to apply for jobs with that one and it didn't work out. So um, my main, I guess, drive for getting a grad degree is that my job basically requires one. It's very hard to get a job in student affairs without one. I'll go ahead and go. Um, I graduated my undergrad in 2013, and after that, you know, I had a couple part-time jobs, kind of looking for something full-time, and finally found some six months after I graduated, full-time job that I was happy with. And I was working there for about a year and a half, and I just realized that I wasn't really being challenged, like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really being fulfilled by the job. And so at that point, I was like, well, I think maybe it's time to go back to school. I've always loved uh, school. And so... That was the kind of impetus for my master's um, and kind of and during that process during while I was a master's student, you know, I was thinking about, okay, do I want to teach, you know, do I want to do research, what I want to do, and I just really fell in love with like just being a, at a university and kind of balancing teaching and research. And so that's why I'm now doing a PhD because I want to be a professor one day. So um, for me, um, we a pro professional degree is required to get a license in architecture. So I, you know, I've always wanted to be an architect and I, I knew I would have to get um, a graduate degree at, at one point. Um, but I also love academia and um, I was, you know, always looking forward to going back and experiencing college from, you know, an older perspective. And uh, it just happened to, and I was, I was talking to Kathleen before this, that um, uh, my visa, because I'm, I'm here in the country under a student visa, and now I'm in a, you know, a H-1B, which is uh, an employment visa. And so my student visa OPT time was ending, and um, I decided to apply for grad school, and um, everything lined up and, you know, ended up at Clemson again. So that was kind of my experience. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so let me ask you, how did you decide uh, which schools that you're going to apply to? And even at how many schools did you apply to? Okay. Anyone who wants to, to jump in? Um. What I can tell you is that at least in the system I grew up, um, you don't have a choice to apply to many different schools. Typically, you do your career in one school, and if everything goes right, you can stay. Um, so for me, it was sort of an, an easy choice. Perhaps um, some of the people that are here in Clemson as a grad student uh, could tell more. Um, yeah, so for me, my partner and I moved to Durham, North Carolina the year prior to me applying. So um, knowing that we had just moved, I didn't really want to go across the country. I wanted to stay in the area. So I also being from South Carolina and just like looking around the area, I wanted an experience where I had a social justice based program in a more conservative area because I wanted the challenge. 
And um, I knew that the students that I worked with, the student population, which is Latinx and other people of color, you know, needed to see a role model in me. So that's um, partially why I chose Clemson. Also, financial aid, all of that stuff kind of ended up working out for me. But I had plans to apply to three schools. I ended up applying to, to two, and then I interviewed and accepted one. Yeah, I think, so for me, the process was different for my master's and my PhD. And I think I'll focus on my master's just because that's probably what most folks are interested in. I think when I was starting to think about grad school, I, the first step was probably narrowing geographically, kind of like Julia was mentioning. Uh, I knew I, I wasn't really ready to go somewhere far at that point. Um, and so I think the few schools I ended up applying to were all in California. Um, but I think something that a lot of undergrads don't realize, like at least in STEM and science, technology, engineering, and math, is that the, really the first step, if you want to do research for a graduate degree, is find an advisor, right? So often you have to make a connection with an advisor, and that, that maybe looks like emailing them or meeting them, meeting them at a conference. Um, and then they can sort of support your application to that school. And so that's what I did is I, you know, basically Googled who's doing wildlife research in California and actually reached out to an old um, graduate mentor that I worked with as an undergrad. And she was helpful. I was like, hey, like, I want to do research that we, I kind of helped you on, like who's doing this kind of work. And she connected me with someone that I ended up actually doing my master's with. So narrowed geographically and then, you know, looked at potential interests and then also um, had some networking connections which helped. Okay. Yeah. I, I can add to that. I, I applied to just Clemson and um, I was pretty sure that's where I wanted to end up for grad school. And similar to Alex, I, I had a connection that I, you know, I kept from undergrad. Um, and actually my first, uh, my first job was with a Clemson professor and um, just having him as a mentor. And um, I, I was really interested in also the design build program at the Clemson Architecture School. So I knew that I wanted to do that and, you know, I ended up applying to Clemson, so. If, in chemistry at least, or in the sciences, uh, we typically have a mixture of these opinions and what I tell my students uh, here in Clemson since we are in one side of the country is to try to find something totally different um, just to give them a different perspective in life uh, a different exposure to culture uh, to ways of learning ways of doing things those are all great um tips to follow for deciding where to apply, doing homework, um, you know, seeing who's doing research that you're interested in, and also, you know, the physical location. Some people have the freedom to go to the other, uh, other end of the country or another country. Um, some want to stay local or need to stay local. So all those things factor into deciding um, what schools you're going to apply to. All right, so when it comes to the application process, um, talk to us, how was that for you? And do you have any tips uh, with regards to any of the aspects of the application, letters of recommendation, the personal statement? How did you prepare for a standardized test? And um, Dr. Garcia, if you want to talk tips, what you would advise for like how you, because you're one who reviews applications. so. What do you look for when you're reading a personal statement or letters of recommendation? I'll, I'll let them speak first. Okay. <laughs> uh, this one's tough because it's, it's all like everyone's program is very specific to them. Um, so I'll speak to my experience, but um, honestly, like super lucky that I kept in touch with one of my professors from because I you know with the gap years it's easy to lose touch with people and with the recommendations you need them 
So, um, you know, if you're taking a gap year or not, definitely try to keep in touch with a favorite professor. And I wouldn't even say that this professor gave me the best grades, but I was always at our office hours, so she knew me from that. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of schools are starting to do away with GREs, but um, when I took my GRE, I just focused on the English because that was what was relevant for my program. My math scores are, I don't want to talk about them, they're just so bad, but you know, that's not what my, you know, the people looking over my application cared about. So, you know, definitely like focus on, you know, what your program's looking for. For mine, it was very heavily based in essays. So I, I threw all of my energy behind the essays. Same, my, my program um, is a portfolio based application. So, uh, you know, most of the eff effort and time went into just having a portfolio that um, expressed some of my undergraduate education and also some of my uh, short professional experience before grad school. Um, and, and, you know, just keeping it really clean and uh, simple, but you know, expressing what you know um, on the portfolio, I think was really important. And like Julia said, just keeping in touch with, uh, with a mentor or a professor was, was really helpful for my application, I think. Yes, I think similar to what the last two mentioned, um, I think writing and like being able to communicate well is really important when applying just generally. And not only like if you're reaching out to a professor, professor, like an initial kind of email or um, kind of first impressions, you want to basically be a good communicator, kind of show them that you're kind of thinking at um, a level at least that, that they can work with, right? That you understand their research, that you understand where your interests align with theirs. And that goes for the, the essay as well. Um, and I think, you know, in my experience, at least, like the hard part is really getting a professor to really back your application. Um, and I'm not gonna say that like the actual application part is a formality, but as, if you have someone like professor that really wants to work with you, I think that kind of goes a long way towards getting into that program in that university. And I, I think, oh, yeah, do, go ahead, Dr. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think that highlights the importance of um, and I think Julia pointed out that each program's a little different. So knowing the requirements, um, you know, hers was the essays are really weighted heavily. Whereas for, for Alex, it's finding somebody that you can do research with. Um, and so those are important factors to investigate and find out so you know where to put your efforts. I, I, I would like to second most of the things that have said, that the, the students have said about applications. Uh, one important part, from my perspective at least, is to go to the point. Uh, people that write <clears throat> personal essays that are four or five pages long end up being way too long. Keep in mind that most people like me end up reviewing hundreds of applications. And we are really busy. We don't have time to read about the impact that kindergarten had in your career. Go to the point, tell me in a page or less why you are the candidate I'm looking for. Uh, use those, those, that one page or those two pages at the most uh, to address specific needs and justify specific things in your application. So for example, uh, my GPA was not at the top. Make sure that if that is your case, you justify it. I'd rather take a mid a 3.0 GPA from a person that had a full-time job than a 4.0 of a person that has no motivation. The other thing that is very important is that those simple pages that you have to write and that will tell everything about yourself are unique. 
the last thing you want is to copy and paste something that you found in Google. Make it, make it unique, make it personal, and try to make that connection. Reaching out to professors could definitely be a help, um, especially if you're trying to make a connection to one-to-one. -to -one. So if I'm trying to get a job with Alex, the best thing I would do is to go to his webpage, read a couple of papers, and write him an email saying, hey, Alex, I wrote, I read your paper about happy zebra fishes. I'm not sure, making that up. Uh, and I found intriguing that the fishes have three stripes instead of two, as I believed my whole life. Um, I would like to know if you would be willing to share more of that information with me. And if at all possible, I would like to inquire about the possibility to learn and to work with you. Try not to make those empty connections that some students do. You know, they are sir slash madam. You don't even take the time to check the person. Those are great points. Excellent points. Thank you. Um, so let's let's move on to talk about how how have you all this. Um, been able to fund your graduate education. Um, what funding opportunities did you encounter and what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to um, not go into further debt for graduate school? In, in the sciences, uh, most PhDs or most PhDs uh, come with funding in the form of TA. Um, if you have the chance to work with somebody and develop an application, uh, for example, for an NSF program and get your own funding, you're golden. You can, you can go anywhere. The problem is to be competitive for a TA or an RA position. And those could be a little bit harder. Uh, but if, at least in the sciences, um, we are poor. We, we cannot go into more debt to go to grad school. Most of these things, if you are, if you are a good student or if you are a, an okay student, uh, you will get a position with funding. Yeah, jumping off that, so for my master's, my source of funding was being a TA, right? I was just teaching one or two biological sciences labs a semester. Um, and for my PhD, I actually have a research grant, which is great. So. I don't have to, I don't have to teach. I just get paid to do my research. Um, and I've taken some classes as well, but, um, but I'd say overall funding can be a real concern, right? Like for students, but I would say the good news is that your advisor, your potential advisor should be just as concerned as you are about having getting funding for you. A good advisor should not take you on without some source of funding. That could be teaching. That could be a grant for you. It could be part, half and half. Um, and so that should be a conversation that you have with a potential advisor fairly early on, right? And if they're, if they're not bringing it up or not being transparent about it, to me, that's a red flag. Um, and like Kathleen mentioned, um, or uh, Dr. Garcia mentioned, um, those NSFs can really be a great, great gig. Um, Dr. Carlos, if you think the sciences don't have funding, just imagine the arts. Um, we, uh, so I think for me, um, being, you know, uh, a, a student on a student visa, I was out of state. So funding was a, was a big, big issue. Um, but, uh, I was able to get a graduate assistantship on the planning department. So, um, that is to say that if, even if you don't get a TA in your department, you can still use your skills and, in other parts of the university, and there's always, you know, GAs and in, in, in other departments. So um, I was able to do that to fund most of my um, my my grad school. Um, but also when I was studying in Charleston, you know, I was able to transfer to a TA. So there's, I think there's multiple avenues, and um, you just have to look for them. But they're out there. So. For my program, which is student affairs, we're a 
required uh, to have a graduate assistantship uh, to enroll in the program. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, so my um, assistantship requires me to work 25 hours a week and I get a stipend every two weeks, kind of like a paycheck, and I get full tuition remission. And so with all of that, it's pretty good package considering some programs will charge you a lot of money, full tuition, 60K for the same degree. Not, not worth it <laughs> for the kind of salary I'm gonna get when I graduate. But um, yeah, I, I still had to pay some fees, um, which is the, the university sets up a payment plan, which is really great for that. Um, my stipend is, uh, I wouldn't say totally livable. It's mostly livable. It's it's it covers rent and some groceries. So definitely a consideration that even though having your school like paid for on paper, um, if you're low, coming from a lower income background, you you know might want to consider like the time commitment of taking a part time job or saving up money beforehand or you know what all of that could look like loans. Um, I chose not to take loans, so for me, that looks like a part-time job and saving up money during the summer. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing that. And I would also add to that, um, a, maybe a lesser known way to fund a graduate education would be to work at a university. Um, and most universities will waive tuition for their employees. And so I've, I've earned um, a master's here at Clemson, master's of human resource development um, by going part-time and my six credits a semester were waived. So um, that's also another way to not have to go into debt if you're interested in a program that allows part-time students. Oh, whoops, okay, let's see. Um, so before we wrap up the, the admissions section of our discussion um, tonight, can you talk about um, what advice would you give to somebody who might be on the fence, not sure if they want to go to graduate school or not? And was there anything you um, you wish you had done to prepare for grad school um, that you didn't, maybe that you didn't do, looking back on the process? So what would you advise if somebody is on the fence? David? <laughs> um, I guess what I would have done better if I had another go round, I, I think my time between undergrad and grad school, I was really focused on just, you know, my first job. And um, I feel like I lost a little bit of touch with just academia. So I, I, I think I lost a lot of just reading books and being involved in some of the just, you know, higher thinking uh, parts of the profession. Uh, so I think that um, even now, I feel like I, I, I really want to go back to that. And that's one of the things that I loved about grad school. So if it's, you know, I personally, that's what I would have done is just, uh, you know, kept studying, even if I was, you know, after undergrad and just reading books and part of, you know, some of the conceptual stuff, so. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of pros and cons lists. I think those can be helpful. Um, sometimes if you flip a coin and you get a result and your, like, your gut reaction is one way or the other, that's another thing <laughs> with making decisions, but um, for me, it just felt like the right time. And maybe it was because I was working at a cafe and I was tired of it, but, <laughs> you know, I, I did miss being at, it, at, at school. I miss being around students. I missed, you know, programming and like socializing and all of those aspects. So um, just felt like it was ready to go back. And it's just, you know, you kind of look for that feeling and it, I really enjoyed the gap years that I took, even though they were kind of a struggle, but um, that was that was what worked for me. Yeah, I agree with Julia. I 
just generally trust your instincts. Um, I'll, I'll kind of tell a story. So I applied to probably like 10 PhD programs in total. So like halfway through my master's kind of started that process. And, you know, I contacted a bunch of professors and heard from a few of them, you know, I ended up having a relationship with, with several of them. Um, I only ended up getting, you know, an offer from one uh, university in, in, in Ohio, Ohio University. I went to go visit in February and so it just didn't feel like right. Um, like I wasn't super excited about the research I'd be doing. It was pretty cold and I don't like being cold. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, but the hard thing was that was the only PhD program I got into that year. And so like I had a choice, like, do I just take this and get a PhD or do I just wait and apply again next year and hope I find something better, right? And I, at that point, I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm not, this doesn't feel right. I'm not going to do it. And so I kind of had a full-time job. I had a full-time job lined, lined up just not too long after that, starting to work. Um, and then I got an email from my current advisor here at Clemson. He was like, hey, I'd like to talk with you. And I kind of forgotten that I had applied to this position just with everything going on. Um, and, you know, I wasn't all excited about it. And, but now that I'm here, like, it's, it's the best decision I've made. You know, like, I'm super excited to be here. I love research. It was totally the right call to say no to that, even though it was a hard decision. Um, and so I just, just trust your instincts, I think. And I think, you know, if, if you're maybe applying somewhere far, like, it really helps to, and for me, like, I need to go there and, like, experience what it's like to live there um, and not just, you know, not visit. Um, so try and get a vibe for the place, too. I would say if you're on the fence, jump the fence. Uh, grad school is probably the best time of your life. Um, it will give you the opportunity to stay in college, but sort of to take the driver's seat of your career. It, it is a totally different feeling. And in my particular case, I decided to stay in college. So I not only went to grad school, but then I did a postdoc, and then I became a professor. So um, my wife said that I never really had a job. Um, in, in my case, uh, I, most days I, I share that feeling. Um, I, I find it incredible, that the, the chance to interact daily uh, with people like in this panel that are, are really excited about learning and doing new things. And, and the mentoring of the students is, is really what drives my, my passion. Um, I, I see that here about two thirds of the people are considering masters programs uh, and only one third consider uh, doctor degrees. Uh, I would like to make sure that you guys, if you're on the fence, you jump the right fence uh, because the objectives of the master's and the PhD are very different and the kind of doors, the kind of green that you see on the other side of the fence is, is very different. So it, I, I'm sensitive of the fact that it depends on the career, depends on the field, depends on the personality, depends on the personal uh, situation, depends on family situation, depends on the timeline, depends on everything. But think about it. It's, it's worth the jump. Uh, you just need to think about it. All right, take the jump. Excellent. Um, so now let's move on to um, life as a graduate student. So um, what concerns did you have about being a student or um, a Latinx student or a faculty or Latinx student or student of color? Um, and I had faculty in there as well. Um, when you before you started graduate school, and then how have you found the climate at Clemson? Um, and did did anything alleviate those concerns? If so, what was it? Um, I can try to start. It's it's a big question. Um, I grew up in South Carolina, but spent all of my adulthood outside of South Carolina. So, you know, um, my college experience in upstate New York looks a lot different than it would have if I had stayed in state. 
And um, I think that really kind of, um, I don't know, it had a really big effect on how I viewed myself, like how I came into my identity and all of that. So um, I was excited to come back to South Carolina and meet students because I work with undergraduates who maybe had experiences or backgrounds that were closer to mine. But I think I underestimated my own reverse culture shock because <laughs> coming back to South Carolina after having been away was really hard for me. Um, and I found the environment not the best, but it also challenged me to grow in ways that I wasn't expecting. So as hard as it's been, I think I can come away with this experience um, a lot stronger, a lot more aware of what um, issues face Latinx students, including myself um, in South Carolina, in the upstate area at Clemson. And I've made a lot of friends along the way. Like we formed LGSA last year. It's been a huge accomplishment, you know, meeting other people who are going through this with me. And it's, it's just been really great. Thank you. And I, I pulled up a slide here that these are um, 2019 statistics or data. Um, Graduate students at Clemson University, 192 identified as Hispanic, which is 3.4% of our graduate student population. Um, so just to give those who are, who are with us um, a sense of the, the breakdown. Um, and I wanna encourage our panelists to be completely candid um, and honest about the climate here. Um, and again, like, were, those, were you able to alleviate any of those concerns um, what has helped and what's maybe still a challenge? Um, it, it, is, it is clear that in, in many of the academic environments are not, minorities are still minorities. Uh, this applies to African-Americans, this applies to Hispanics, this applies in many fields to females. Uh, you, you name the category. Um, that said, I think Clemson is particularly well positioned in terms of having an inclusive campus environment. I'm, I'm extremely proud of, of, of the feeling uh, I get when I walk around. Um, it's not uncommon for people to have that uh, imposter feeling of having, of, of, of thinking, uh, because I'm the only one that has this weird accent, um, they may think less of me. Um, that's also an opportunity to teach everybody that with this weird accent, we can be as good as anybody else. Um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's a time of change in, in the country. It's a time of change in the world. It's, it's a very exciting time uh, for all of us uh, to make a contribution, uh, regardless of how we make that contribution. And I personally think at least my program is extremely proud of doing everything we can uh, to bring uh, diversity and to integrate every participant of the program. Um, Kathleen has highlighted the Hispanics in that, in that field is definitely uh, a very small bar, uh, but I can tell you that um, we have great parties and we have a great time, even with 3.4%. I don't have a ton to say here. Um, I think partly because I've always been able to like pass as white kind of growing up uh, and I've been privileged in that sense. Um, but with that said, you know, being a student in California, I definitely felt more, more at home there. Um, like Hispanic Latinx culture there is just kind of part of life, right? Like it's kind of everywhere. Um, and here it's, it's, it seems just a niche. Um, and so, and, but being involved in, the, in LGSA has been great for me. 
and you know I'm still learning and kind of learning Spanish and stuff. So uh, it's been a growing process, but um, yeah, it's an it's an important part of the experience. Yeah, my my experience was um, a culture shock. Um, I mean, it's I moved when I was 18, and uh, being an, an international student, just being at college was already a culture shock. But you know, being in a in an area that doesn't have a lot of Hispanics um, uh, was you know something new. But um, I, I was involved with the international community while I was at Clemson. So I, I made a lot of great friends and, uh, you know, found uh, a niche in, I guess, uh, student life there. Um, so I, you know, I felt part of, of something, I guess. Uh, so I think it, it in general, I, I did not have a negative experience at Clemson and uh, being from somewhere else was, was always, um, you know, in the back of my mind, but it wasn't the main, uh, the main thing. Um, so I think it, um, in general, it was, it was great. And I think there's a, there's a place in, on campus and there's groups on campus that, uh, that you can be part of. Um, um, so there's a place for everyone, I think. Okay, thank you for sharing on that. Um, I want to make sure that we leave enough time for question and answer. So um, one last question for our panelists before we go to the Q&A. Um, so work-life balance as a graduate student, what does that look like for you? How do you manage your workload? Um, at least in, in the chemistry side, uh, it's a very challenging time because the work uh, will take most of your time and will leave very little for your life side. Um, I was lucky enough because I was I married about halfway into grad school and my wife made sure I had a somehow balanced work life. Um, I can tell you that I, in some more than one occasion, I would wake up in the middle of the night with the answer to my experiment and I'll just get dressed and go back to the lab and she was able to tolerate that. So, um, but, but it's a challenging time, uh, but it's also a very unique time and, and you have to make, take every opportunity to make sure you take advantage of that time. I think this is a question I have to answer every semester because it always just looks so different. Um, and my program is really good at promoting work-life balance, but not putting it into practice. So um, it's it's it is challenging because you know I have my assistantship, I have my courses, I have my job, I have free time that I have to somehow fit in there too. Um, I think it's nice that there's student, like grad student groups that I can go to, um, you know, for the social piece, uh, for support, professional development. So that's definitely helpful. Um, LGSA has been one of those for me. And I think just setting your boundaries based on how you know yourself and, you know, burnout, compassion, fatigue, all of that is like a whole big thing, conversation, rabbit hole, but, um, you know, just knowing yourself and how you work and staying, like, sticking to your boundaries is really important. I guess I'll go. Um, I think I had a better work-life balance as a master's student. Uh, I'm not really sure why. I think for me nowadays, it's really easy just to work all day. And I actually really enjoy my research. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Maybe like Dr. Garcia. Um, and I'm single, so I don't really have like all those, those familial responsibilities or kids or things like that. So obviously uh, a lot of people have. Um, and so I have a lot of freedom there. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, kind of like Julie was saying, like it's it's up to you, right? And I think even even within semesters for me, like kind of the core of the semester, you know, weeks, I don't know, four through twelve or whatever can be really crazy with teaching responsibilities and research and classes if you if you have them. Um, and then like finals week can be a breeze, right? Because you might not have any finals if you're a grad student. So kind of just depends. Um, but it's fun. The architecture program is another program that promotes work-life balance, but you still see students working in studio at 2 a.m. regularly. Um, but I think it it was it was tough um, grad school on work life. I was I was working 15 hours on my GA every week, as well on top of you know um, normal normal hours. So, um, but I think it pushed me to. Um, just have control over my schedule a lot more than I did in undergrad. And it definitely prepared me for professional life and just, you know, the next step. Um, I, I definitely felt like uh, I, I, I had to set limits on how much time I, I worked. Um, and, and that helped me just become more efficient with my work. And um, I think I learned a lot from, from, from that time. Excellent. Thank you, panelists. Um, I think now I will stop sharing my screen and ask Larissa um, if you'll just toss out the questions and um, whichever panelist wants to respond. Sure. So we had a lot of great um, questions answered as well in the chat. Thanks to Dr. Garcia and Alex and some others. But I will read them out again, um, just in case y'all want to give some more insight into what your answers meant or other things that you want to say. Um, so the first one we had was, what if you're not happy with your decision in terms of your grad school program? How difficult is it to change programs? Um, I'll kind of answer this. I just saw a question that's kind of related to that, so I'll tie it all together. Um, my program's only two years, so if you don't like it, then, I mean, you don't really switch. Um, I guess, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure people do, Brandon, do you know? People do switch, but it's, it's hard because the time is so small. Do you know, Marissa? Yeah, I know that when we have a student that switched schools, like she left our master's program and went to another one. So I think kind of the same that um, Dr. Garcia answered in terms of like making sure that those credits will transfer. Um, and of course, Brandon was in a different graduate program, so. Yeah. On that, I, I can speak on that a little bit. Um, so I was in a, I was in a graduate, an online graduate program at Northeastern doing student affairs. And ironically, that let I, I didn't like online um, learning, so that led me to Clemson. And I say ironically because here we are doing online classes. Um, but uh, I, t I, I was in two previous grad programs. I was one at Northeastern, one at Lee University. And so I transferred in, I had about five, well, 15 credits worth of grad work that I transferred into Clemson. And Clemson only took nine. So one thing I would look at is check to see how much if you are going to change check to see how much that program will take because they usually will say you know we'll take up to six or up to nine what all from what i've seen it's only been six and nine i haven't seen grad programs take up to 12 because that's literally a grad you know a master's program is 36 hours so it's literally a third of the program that you would transfer in so um just check to see how much they would take if you're looking at transferring credit and um and as long as you talk to the faculty the professors i mean sometimes they'll be They'll be pretty lenient with what transfers in and what doesn't. It definitely happens. It's just, you know, the program being so short, it doesn't happen, you know, super often. Yeah, I mean, it happens, right? I mean, some people go to grad school and realize that, oh, I shouldn't be here. Um, and that's okay, right? I think it's fairly common in my field that sometimes people will, but often, uh, I guess the biggest thing that people run into is like problems with their advisor, right? Like it's not working out, like they don't work well together. It's not what they expected, right? So sometimes 
students will just switch advisors and so stay in the same university, same department, switch advisors. That seems fairly common if you know it's not something not working out there. Um, but then, I mean, starting over somewhere else is going to happen too, of course. Sorry, guys, I'm reading. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember what we talked about already and what we haven't. Um, another one that came up was how did you go about getting a graduate assistantship? I know that some people have spoken to that, um, but if there's any other advice that y'all have, definitely share that. I, would, I can see, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna throw out that um, just as a trend, PhDs are more typically funded than masters. Um, that's a nationwide trend, it varies from program to program, school to school, and if your program doesn't, the masters doesn't have um, a PhD partner, um, then that's a different story, like quite often like architecture or student affairs or something. But, um, PhDs, typically there's more funding available than for masters. Yeah, I, I think in, uh, in my experience, I, I, you know, I, I applied to a job that I knew for, for the university that I knew that was opening up at the planning department. Um, so I think if you, if you look for, for them, I think there's, there's jobs that you can apply for uh, and uh, you can get a graduate assistantship even if it's not in your program but that's that was my experience good advice I, I was going to say that um, as, as long as you apply um, to multiple schools uh, make just like when you're applying to to college uh, make a list of the places that you would love to be that you can reasonably be in the places that you definitely don't want to be. And even if you don't get into your top category for a PhD, for example, you may consider getting a master's in an okay place and then transfer the credits and move up. Um, that's totally okay. Um. I think this question that is, is really applicable to our current times right now, um, they said, what is your advice on trying to get a sense of the campus lab slash life while not being able to actually visit the campus because of COVID? So if you guys have any types of strategies that y'all have been using during this time of COVID, those would be greatly appreciated. Uh, this is gonna sound super lame, um, but I, so I attended my undergrad institution without having visited. What I did was I looked online internet forums um, and just read what people were saying. Um, people are very candid online and we'll talk about, you know, positives and negatives for their program, for the school. Um, I watched videos. I stalked the website everywhere. Um, for me now, you know, thinking about schools I might want to work at, I would look at resources for students of color, um, look at, you know, accessibility, what their priorities are, their mission statement, um, what values the school has. I know it's not, it doesn't replicate the feeling of actually being there and like getting that vibe, but um, it worked out for me in undergrad, so I, I think there's some hope. Um, another one that just came up. Oh, did you want something to say? Have something to say, Dr. Garcia? I was about to say that if you if you do not feel, I, I posted a, a, a comment that most programs or many programs have virtual visits, and it's not the same. But can give as as Julia said, it could give you at least some some idea. And there's nothing wrong of waiting for a year if what you really like is to go and meet people face to face. The other thing that I posted is that I'm, I'm by nature very optimistic. So I'm going to think that we will have a vaccine available by the end of the year. So 
if you, if you think about that, most programs have an application deadline sometime in January, February. So you can plan and plan a visit for early next semester. Um, that would be very reasonable. And if none of that work, it's okay to get, to take a year, get a job, mature, know how it feels to, to have an A through five schedule. And then you will probably enjoy much, much better uh, the freedom of grad school. Um, this one that just came up says, do you get a lower stipend if you come in with your own funding or is it added on? In, in, in chemistry, at least, that depends on the type of funding. I know some uh, places will fund you a fraction and then the university is supposed to pay the difference to match the other grad students. You know, for other uh, fellowships or scholarships, that's added on. So it all de depends on the, on the type of funding. Typically, schools do not rule that. I'm looking to see. I think all the other ones have been answered. Um, this is another one that was on there. It said, um, how long did it take you take for you to complete graduate school? And is it what you've expected or what you expected if you're done? <laughs> uh, data typically is available either at the grad school or at the departments. If you have any questions about Clemson, Kathleen is probably going to be able to answer everything. Uh, my program has an average graduation time of 6.1 years, uh, but that depends on the field. Uh, mine was a little shorter than that, fortunately. And if it was everything I expected, absolutely. And, and even more, um, if, if you're thinking about it, uh, consider it. It's definitely one of the best things you can do for your life and for your career. Dr. Garcia, to clarify that six years is for PhDs, right? Masters typically is just two years. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, right? I mean. Well, I think one of the fears that some people have, myself included, is like, oh, I'm just gonna be stuck here for like eight years, right? And that can happen sometimes, um, but normally that means like something went wrong. Um, and I think in my field, I do field work, um, you know, outside. And so something, things, things go wrong all the time because we really can't control like wildlife or nature. Um, but with that said, you know, uh, with a good study design, working with your advisor on that, I think, um, you know, in my field, master's probably two and a half to three years on average, PhDs, I think, in ecology are like, yeah, 5.6 years, six years, something like that. The only thing I think I'll add is even if, if you go for a two-year master's program, but you're working part-time, you're going to school part-time, it'll take a little bit longer. So we have some folks in our cohort who We'll graduate the program like three to four years rather than two. I think for the architecture program specifically, if you typically it's two years for um, masters, but if you come from a different field, um, it's it's a three year uh, process, and that kind of ties into the question about changing you know, your um, your uh, program. I I didn't you know I I went from from undergrad in, grad in architecture to grad in architecture. But in my experience with people coming from other degrees, it was, it was a very steep learning curve for their first year. But um, beyond that, it was, I mean, we were on a level playing field. And I think uh, when, you know, I, I joined the, the people that were in the, were in the three-year program, it was, it was, it was just a, a level playing field, so. 
if, if you're interested in, in changing programs, um, you know, you can do that in architecture too. Just saw another pop up. It says, um, if you are out of state um, slash didn't go to Clemson, should you try and get to know an advisor before you apply? I can jump in real quick. I think that will vary by program. Um, definitely a program that's research focused um, in the STEM and in other, other areas. Um, if you can identify a faculty advisor that you would like to work with, um, that's an advantage. And some programs will actually ask you to identify somebody as part of the application process. Uh, for other programs, um, it isn't like an MBA. It wouldn't be necessary. Um, it wasn't necessary for human resource development. I'm not sure about student affairs. Um, but for some other programs, maybe not as much so. And I'll let anyone else chime in with their experience. Yeah, I have something to add. So this goes along with that question and also the question about getting a vibe on a school. So a big part of my application process was looking at the faculty, picking out a, facu a faculty member who had an interest or research that was, you know, similar to what I wanted to do or just interesting and emailing them about what their experience was as a faculty member of color, a woman of color, you know, that type of thing and like try to see what they thought of the school and the program. Um, I'll let you know that the program I did not attend had a very cold response to me. They passed me along to their program coordinator. She didn't even respond. And the Clemson professor was like so helpful, like answered all of my questions, was super empathetic and, and honest with me about what to expect with the program. So I found it helpful to reach out to people in advance for that reason. But I, I wouldn't say it gave me a boost on my application or anything. I don't see any others that are unanswered. But please let me know if you all had something else that I missed. I just wanted to say, so Kathleen made a good point, right? The application varies so much depending on your program. But even within sciences, there are programs where you don't really need an advisor straight away. Um, I have a friend who's doing his PhD in microbiology at the University of Oregon, and he applies to the program, and it's more of a cohort system. And so he does what's called rotations the first year. And basically he chooses three different advisors that he wants to work with throughout that first year. And at the end of that first year, he then selects one of those advisors um, just based on chemistry, based on you know, uh, research interests aligning. And so there, there are some programs like that as well in the sciences, so that's something to keep in mind. We, we have something like that. It's, it's not a formal rotation but we have short visits and students are supposed to pick uh, or select three potential advisors. Um, but I'm sort of on the fence on that because uh, if you reach out to a person and you're able to make that connection, uh, life is easier. Don't think I see any others. Okay, um, well, if there's not any other questions, we will wrap up. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join this discussion. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Um, we hope that this has been beneficial for those of you who have attended. Um, and as you consider pursuing a graduate degree, we ask that you consider Clemson University. Um, graduate school really is all about the fit. Um, and we may offer the program that you like, we may not, but we ask you to at least consider Clemson in that process. Um, so to make that even easier, uh, we are going to waive the application fee for anyone who attended the session today. Um, we'll receive an email from, from us um, within the next couple of days with um, information on how to, how to obtain an application fee waiver and also a link to a short survey because we would love your feedback on this session. So um, thank you so much for attending and if you do have any other questions, um, I know we've listed our, our contact information there, so please feel free. And if anybody needs a recording of this with a transcription, please let us 
please let us know. We'll be happy to provide that for you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Enjoy. Good night. Good, good meeting, everybody. Good job, everyone.